to Windy Night Stories. Tonight's story is a quiet tale by Cynthia Asquith called The Corner Shop. Peter Wood's executors found their task a very easy one. He had left his affairs in perfect order. The only surprise yielded by his methodical writing table was a sealed envelope on which was written, Not wishing to be bothered by well-meaning research societies, I have never shown the enclosed to anyone. But after my death, all are welcome to read what, to the best of my knowledge, is a true story. The manuscript, which bore a date three years previous to the death of the writer, was as follows. I have long wished to record an experience of my youth. I won't attempt any explanations. I draw no conclusions. I merely narrate certain events. One foggy evening, at the end of a day of enforced idleness in my chambers, I had just been called to the bar, I was rather dejectedly walking back to my lodgings when my attention was drawn to the brightly lit window of a shop. Seeing the word antiques on its signboard, and remembering that I owed a wedding present to a lover of bric-a-brac, I grasped the handle of the green door. Opening with one of those cheerful jingle-jangle bells, it admitted me into a large rambling premises, thickly crowded with all the traditional treasure and trash of a curiosity shop. Suits of armor, warming pans, cracked, misted mirrors, church vestments, spinning wheels, brass kettles, chandeliers, gongs, chessmen, furniture of every size and every period. Despite all the clutter, there was none of the dusty gloom one associates with such collections. Far from being dingy, the room was brightly lit and a crackling fire leaped up the chimney. In fact, the atmosphere was so warm and cheerful that after the cold, dank fog outside, it struck me as most agreeable. At my entrance, a young woman and a girl, by their resemblance obviously sisters, rose from armchairs. Bright, bustling, gaily dressed, they were curiously unlike the type of people who usually preside over such wares. A flower or a cake shop would have seemed a far more appropriate setting. Inwardly awarding them high marks for keeping the place so clean, I wished the sisters a good evening. Their smiling faces and easy manners made a very pleasant impression on me, but though they were most obliging in showing me all their treasures and displayed considerable knowledge as well as appreciation, they seemed wholly indifferent as to whether or not I made any purchase. I found a small piece of Sheffield plate very moderately priced and decided that this was the very present for my friend. Explaining that I was without sufficient cash, I asked the elder sister if she would take a check. Certainly, she answered, briskly producing pen and ink. Will you please make it out to Corner Curio Shop? It was with conscious reluctance that I left the cheerful precincts and plunged back into the saffron fog. Good evening, sir. Always pleased to see you at any time, rang out the elder sister's pleasant voice, a voice so engaging that I left almost with a sense of having made a friend. I suppose it must have been a week later that, as I walked home one bitter cold evening, fine powdery snow brushing against my face, a cutting wind lashing down the streets, I remembered the welcoming warmth of the cheerful corner shop and decided to revisit it. I found myself to be on the very street, and there, yes, there was the very corner. It was with a sense of disappointment, out of all proportion to the event, that I found the shop wore that baffling, shut-eyed appearance and read the uncompromising word, closed. An icy gust of wind whistled round the corner. My wet trousers flapped dismally against my chapped ankles. Longing for the warmth and glow within, I felt annoyingly thwarted. Rather childishly, for I was certain the door was locked, I grasped the handle and shook it. To my surprise, it turned in my hand, but not in answer to its pressure. The door was opened from within, and I found myself looking into the dimly lit countenance of a very old and extremely frail-looking little man. "'Please to come in, sir,' said a gentle, rather tremulous voice, and feeble footsteps shuffled away ahead of me. It is impossible to describe the altered aspect of the place. I suppose the electric light had fused, for the darkness of the large room was thinned only by two guttering candles, and in their wavering light dark shapes of furniture, formerly brightly lit, now loomed towering and mysterious, casting weird, almost menacing shadows. The fire was out. Only one faintly glowing ember told that any had lately been alive. 
other evidence there was none, for the grim cold of the atmosphere was such as I had never experienced. The phrase, it struck chill, is laughably inadequate. In retrospect, the street seemed almost agreeable. At least its biting cold there had been bracing. One way or another, the atmosphere of the shop was now as gloomy as it had been bright before. I felt a strong impulse to leave at once, but the surrounding darkness thinned and I saw the old man busily lighting candles here and there. Anything I could show you, sir, he quavered, approaching, taper in hand. I now saw him comparatively distinctly. His appearance made an indescribable impression on me. As I stared, Rembrandt flitted through my mind. Who else could have given any idea of the weird shadows on that ravaged face? Tired is a word we use lightly. Never before had I known what it might mean. Such ineffable, patient weariness. Deep sunk in his weathered face, the eyes seemed as extinct as the fire, and the wan frailty of the small, tremulous, bent frame. The words, dust and ashes, dust and ashes, strayed through my brain. On my first visit, I had, you may remember, been surprised by the uncharacteristic cleanliness of the place. The queer fancy now struck me that this old man was like an accumulation of all the dust one might have expected to find distributed over such premises. In truth, he looked scarcely more solid than the mere conglomeration of dust and cobwebs that might be dispersed at a breath or a touch. What a fantastic old creature to be employed by those well-to-do looking girls. He must, I thought, be some old retainer kept on out of charity. Anything I can show you, sir? repeated the old man. His voice had little more body than the tearing of a cobweb, but there was a curious, almost pleading insistence in it, and his eyes were fixed on me in a wan but devouring stare. I wanted to leave, yes, at once. The mere proximity of the poor old man distressed me, made me feel wretchedly dispirited. Nonetheless, involuntary murmuring, thank you, I'll look around, I found myself following his frail form and absent-mindedly inspecting various objects temporarily illuminated by his trembling taper. The chill silence broken only by the tired shuffle of his carpet slippers got on my nerves. Very cold night, I hazarded. Cold, is it? Cold? Yes, I dare say it is cold. In his gray voice was the apathy of utter indifference. For how many years, I wondered, had this poor old fellow been incapable of his own distress? Been at this job long, I asked, dully contemplating a four-poster bed. A long, long, long time. The answer came as soft as a sigh, and as he spoke, time seemed no longer a matter of days, weeks, months, years, but a weariness that stretched immeasurably. Suddenly I began to resent the old man's exhaustion and melancholy, the contagion of which so unaccountably weighed down my own spirits. How long, O oh Lord, how long, I said as jauntily as I could manage, adding with odious jocularity, old age pension about due, what? No response. In silence, he drifted across to the other side of the room. Quaint piece, this, said my guide, picking up a grotesque little frog that lay on a shelf amongst various odds and ends. It seemed to be made of some substance similar to jade. Soapstone, I guessed. Struck by its oddity, I took the frog from the old man's hand. It was strangely cold. Rather fun, I said. How much? Half a crown, sir, whispered the old man, glancing up at my face. Again, his voice was scarcely more audible than a slithering of dust. But there was a queer gleam in his eyes. Was it eagerness? Could it be? Only half a crown, is that all? I'll have it, said I. Don't bother to pack up old Anthony Rowley. I'll put him in my pocket. As I gave the old man the coin, I inadvertently touched his hand. I could scarcely suppress a start. I have said the frog struck cold, but compared to that desiccated skin, its substance was tepid. I can't describe the chill of that second's contact. Poor old fellow, thought I. He isn't fit to be about, not in this lonely place. I wonder those kind-looking girls allow such an old wreck to struggle on. Good night, I said. Good night, sir. Thank you, sir, quavered the feeble old voice. He shut the door behind me. Turning my head as I breasted the driving snow, I saw his form, scarcely more solid than a shadow, 
dimly outlined against the candlelight. His face was pressed against the big glass pane, and as I walked away I pictured his exhausted patient eyes peering after me. Somehow I was unable to dismiss the thought of that old, old man. Long, long after I was in bed and courting sleep, I saw that ravaged face with its maze of wrinkles, those eyes like lifeless planets staring, staring at me, and in their steady gaze there seemed to be something that besieged. Yes, I was strangely perturbed by that old man. Even after I achieved sleep, my dreams were full of him. Haunted, I suppose by a sense of his infinite tiredness, I was trying to force him to rest, to compel him to lie down. But no sooner did I succeed in laying out his frail form on the four-poster bed I had seen in the shop, only now it seemed more like a grave than a bed, and the brocade coverlet had turned into sods of turf, than he would slip away from my grasp and totteringly resume his rambles round and round the shop. On and on I chased him, down endless avenues or weird furniture, but still he eluded me. Now the dim shop seemed to stretch on and on unendingly, to merge into an infinity of sunless, airless space until at last, exhausted, breathless, I myself collapsed and sank into the four-poster grave. The very next morning an urgent summons took me out of London, and in the anxiety of the ensuing week the episode of the corner shop was banished from my mind. As soon as my father was pronounced out of danger, I returned to my dreary lodgings, Dejectedly engaged in adding up my wretched bills and wondering where on earth to find the money to pay my next quarter's rent, I was agreeably surprised by a visit from an old schoolfellow, at that time practically the only friend I had in London. He was employed by one of the best-known firms of fine art dealers and auctioneers. After some minutes' conversation, he rose in search of a light. My back was turned to him. I heard the sharp scratch of a match, followed by the proprietary noises to his pipe. Suddenly they were broken off by an exclamation. Good God, man, he shouted. Where did you get this? Turning my head, I saw that he had snatched up my purchase of the other night, the funny little frog whose presence on my mantelpiece I had all but forgotten. Closely scrutinizing it through a magnifying glass, he held it under the gas jet, his hands shaking with excitement. Where did you get this, he repeated. Have you any idea what it is? Briefly I told him that, Rather than leave a shop empty-handed, I had bought the frog for half a crown. Half a crown? My dear fellow, I can't swear to it, but I believe you've had one of those amazing pieces of luck one hears of. Unless I'm very much mistaken, this is a piece of jade of the Saya dynasty. If so, it's practically unique. These words conveyed little to my ignorance. Do you mean it's worth money? Worth money? Whew, he ejaculated. Look here. Will you leave this business to me? Let me have the thing for my firm to handle. They'll do the best they can by you. I shall be able to get it into Thursday's sale. Certain that I could implicitly trust my friend, I agreed. Reverently enwrapping the frog in cotton wool, he hurried off. Friday morning I had the shock of my life. Shock does not necessarily imply bad news. I assure you that for some seconds after opening the one envelope lying on my dingy breakfast table, the room spun round and round. The envelope contained an account from Messrs. Spunk, Fine Art Dealers, and Auctioneers. To sale of Syed Jade, £2,000, less 2% commission, 1800 And there, nearby folded, made out to Peter Wood, was Messrs. Spunk check for £1,800. For some time I was completely bewildered. My friend's words had raised hopes hopes that my chance purchase might facilitate the payment of next quarter's rent, might possibly even provide for a whole year's rent. But so large a sum was involved had never so much as crossed my mind. Could it be true, or was it some hideous joke? Surely, in the trite phrase, it was much, much too good to be true. It wasn't the sort of thing that happened to oneself. Still feeling physically dizzy, I rang up my friend. His voice and the heartiness of his congratulations convinced me of the truth of my astounding good fortune. It was neither joke nor dream. I, Peter Wood, whose bank account was at present twenty pounds overdrawn, who, but for shares amounting to one hundred and fifty pounds, possessed no securities whatsoever, now held in my hand a piece of paper convertible into eighteen hundred golden sovereigns. 
I sat down to think, to try to realize, to adjust. From my jumble of plans, problems, and emotions, one fact emerged crystal clear. Obviously, I could not take advantage of that nice girl's ignorance, nor of her poor old caretaker's incompetence, whichever was to blame. No, I couldn't accept this amazing gift from fate, merely because, by a sheer fluke, I had bought a treasure for half a crown. Clearly, I must give back at least half the sum to my unconscious benefactors. Otherwise, I should feel I had robbed them almost as if, like a thief in the night, I had broken into their shop. I remembered their pleasant, open countenances. What fun to astonish them with my wonderful news. I felt a strong impulse to rush to the shop, but having for once a case in court, was obliged to go to the temple. Endorsing Messrs. Spunk's check, I addressed it to the corner curio shop. It was late before I was free to leave the law courts, and when I arrived at the shop I was disappointed but not surprised to read the notice closed. Even supposing the old caretaker to be on duty, there was no particular point in seeing him. My business was with his mistress. Deciding to postpone my visit to the following day, I was just on the point of hurrying home when exactly as though I were expected, the door opened. There on the threshold stood the old man peering out into the darkness. Anything I can do for you, sir? His voice was even queerer than before. I now realized that I had dreaded re-encountering him, yet I found myself irresistibly compelled to enter. The atmosphere was as grimly cold as on my last visit. I felt myself actually shiver. Several candles, obviously only just lit, were burning. By their glimmer, I saw the old man's questioning gaze intently fixed on me. What a face! I had not exaggerated its weirdness. Never had I seen anyone so singular, so striking. No wonder I had dreamed of him. How I wished he had not opened the door. Anything I can show you tonight, sir? His voice trembled. No, thanks. I've come about that thing you sold me the other day. I find it's of great value. Please tell your mistress that I'll pay her a proper price for it tomorrow. As I spoke, there spread over the old man's face the most wonderful smile. I use the word smile for lack of a better word, but how to convey the beauty of the indefinable expression that transfigured that time-worn face. Tender triumph, gentle joy, rapturous reverence. What mystery did I witness? It was like an iron frost yielding to sunshine, the thawing of grief in the dawn radiance of some unsurmisable redemption. For the first time in my life I had some inkling of the word beatitude. I can't describe the impression made on me. The moment, as it were, brimmed over. Time ceased. I became conscious of infinite things. The silence was now broken by the gathering itself together sound of an old clock about to strike. I turned my head towards one of those wonderful, intricate pieces of medieval workmanship, a Nuremberg grandfather clock. From the recess beneath its exquisitely painted face, quaint figures emerged, and while one struck a bell, others demurely stepped through the mazes of a minuet. My attention was riveted by the pretty spectacle. Not until the last sounds had trembled into silence did I turn my head. I found myself alone. The old man had vanished. Surprised that he should leave me, I looked all round the large room. Oddly enough, the fire, which I had supposed dead, had flared into unexpected life and now cast a cheerful glow, but neither fire nor candlelight revealed any trace of the old caretaker. Hello? Hello? I called interrogatively. No answer. No sound save the loud ticking clocks and the crackle of the fire. I walked all round the big room. I even looked into the great four-poster bed of my dreams. Then I saw that there was a smaller adjoining room. Snatching up a candle, I hastened to explore this. At its far end, I discovered a winding staircase leading up to a little gallery. The old man must have withdrawn into some upstairs lair. I would follow him. I groped my way to the foot of the stairs and began to climb. But the steps creaked under my feet. I was conscious of crumbling woodwork. There was an icy draft. My candle went out. Cobwebs brushed against my face. To go any further was most uninviting. I desisted. After all, what did it matter? Let the old man hide himself. I had given my message. Best be gone. But the main room to which I had returned was now quite warm and cheerful. 
whatever had made me think it sinister. It was with a distinct sense of regret that I left the shop. I felt balked. I longed to see that radiant face again. Strange old man. How could I ever have fancied that I feared him? The next Saturday I was free to go straight to the shop. All the way there my mind was agreeably occupied anticipating the welcome the grateful sisters were sure to give me. As a jingle jangle of the bell announced my opening of the door, the two girls, who were busily dusting their goods, turned to see who came in at so unusually early an hour. Recognizing me to my surprise, they bowed amiably but quite casually, as though to a mere acquaintance. With such a fairy tale bond between us, I had expected a very different kind of greeting. I supposed that they had not yet heard the news, and when I told them I had brought the check, I saw that my surprise was right. They looked quite blank. Check? Yes, for the frog I bought the other day. Frog? What frog? I only remember your buying a piece of Sheffield plate. So they knew nothing, not even of my second visit to their shop. By degrees I told them the whole story. They were overcome with astonishment. The elder sister seemed quite dazed. But I can't understand it. I can't understand, she repeated. Holmes, the old caretaker, isn't even supposed to admit anyone in our absence, far less to sell things. He merely comes to take charge on the evenings we leave early and is only supposed to stay till the night policeman comes on duty. I can't believe he let you in and never told us he'd sold you something. It's too extraordinary. What time was it? Round about six, I should think. He generally leaves at half past five, said the girl, but I suppose the policeman must have been late. It was later when I came yesterday. Did you come again, she asked. Briefly, I told her of my visit and the message I had left with the caretaker. What an extraordinary thing, she exclaimed. I can't begin to understand it. But we shall soon hear his explanation. I expect him at any moment now. He comes in every morning to sweep the floors. At the prospect of meeting the remarkable old man again, I felt a thrill of excitement. How would he look by daylight? Should I see him smile again? Very old, isn't he? I hazarded. Old? Yes, I suppose he is getting on, but it's a very easy job. He's a good, honest fellow. I can't imagine his doing anything on the sly. I'm afraid we've been rather slack in our cataloging lately. I wonder if he does sell odds and ends for himself. Oh, no, I can't believe it. By the way, can you remember whereabouts this frog was? I pointed to the shelf from which the caretaker had produced the piece of jade. Oh, from that odd lot I bought the other day for next to nothing. I haven't sorted or priced any of the things yet. I can't remember any frog. What an incredible thing to happen. At this moment the telephone rang. She lifted the receiver. Hello? Hello? Yes, Miss Wilson speaking. Yes, Miss Holmes, what is it? A few seconds startled pause, and then... Dead? Dead? But how? Why? Oh, I am sorry. After a few more words, she replaced the receiver and turned to us, her eyes full of tears. Oh, Bessie, she said to her sister, poor old Holmes is dead. When he got home yesterday, he complained of pain, and he died in the middle of the night, heart failure. No one had any idea there was anything wrong with him. Oh, poor Mrs. Holmes, what will she do? We must go to her at once. Both girls were so upset that I thought it best to leave. The singular old man had made such a haunting impression on me that I was deeply moved to hear of his sudden death. How strange that, except for his wife, I should have been the very last person to speak with him. No doubt pain had seized him in my very presence. That was why he had left so abruptly and without a word. Had death already brushed against his consciousness? That lovely, inexplicable smile? Was that the beginning of the peace that passes all understanding? Next day I told Miss Wilson and her sister all the details of the fabulous sale of the frog and presented my check. Here I met with unexpected opposition. The sisters showed great unwillingness to accept the money. It was, they said, all mine. Besides, they had no need of it. You see, explained Miss Wilson, my father had a flair for this business amounting to a sort of genius. He made quite a large fortune. When he became too old to carry on the shop, we kept it open, partly out of sentiment, partly for the sake of occupation, but we don't need to make any profit. 
At last I prevailed upon them to accept the money, if only to spend it on various charities in which they were interested. It was a relief to my mind when the matter was settled. The extraordinary incident of the jade frog made a bond between us, and in the course of our amicable arguments we became very friendly. I fell into the way of dropping in on them quite often, and soon began to rely on their sympathetic companionship. I never forgot the impression made on me by the old man, and often questioned the sisters about the poor caretaker, but they had nothing of any interest to tell me. They merely described him as an old dear, who had been in their father's service for years and years. No further light was thrown on his sale of the frog. Naturally, they did not like to question his widow. One evening, while I was having tea in the inner room with the elder sister, I picked up a photograph album. Turning its pages, I came upon a remarkably fine likeness of the old man. There, before my eyes, was that strange, striking countenance. But evidently this photograph had been taken many years before I saw him. The face was fuller and had not yet acquired the frail, infinitely wearied look I remembered. But what magnificent eyes! There certainly was something extraordinarily impressive about the man. What a splendid photograph of poor old Holmes, I said. Photograph of Holmes? I had no idea there was one. Let's see. As I handed her the open book, her young sister, Bessie, looked in through the open door. I'm off to the movies now, she called out. Father's just rung up to say he'll be round in a few minutes and have a look around that Sheraton sideboard. All right, Bessie, I'll be here and very glad to have Father's opinion, said Miss Wilson, taking the album from my hand. I can't see any photograph of old Holmes, she said. I pointed to the top of the page. That, she exclaimed, why, that's my dear father. Your father, I gasped. Yes, I can't imagine any two people more unalike. It must have been very dark when you saw Holmes. Yes, yes, it was very dark, I said quickly, just to gain time to think, for I felt bewildered. No degree of darkness could possibly explain any such mistake. I had no moment's doubt as to the identity of the man I had taken for the caretaker with the one whose photograph I held in my hand. But what an amazing, inexplicable thing. Her father. Why on earth should he have been in the shop unknown to his daughters? For what possible motive had he concealed his sale of the frog? And when he heard of its value, why had he left the girls under the impression that it was Holmes, the dead caretaker, who had sold it? Had he been ashamed to confess his own inadvertence? Or was it possible that the girls had never told him the astonishing sequel to the tale? Did they perhaps not want him to know of their sudden acquisition? Into what strange family intrigue had I stumbled? But whoever it was who had been so secretive, it was none of my business. I didn't want to give anyone away. No, I must hold my tongue. The younger sister had said the father was just coming. Would he recognize me as his customer? If so, it might be rather embarrassing. It's a splendid face, I said shyly. Isn't it, she said with pleased eagerness. So clever and strong, don't you think? I remember when that photograph was taken. It was just before he got religion. The girl spoke as if she referred to some distressing illness. Did he suddenly become very religious? Yes, she said reluctantly. Poor father. He made friends with a priest and became so changed. He was never the same again. From the break in the girl's voice, I guess she thought her father's reason had been affected. Perhaps this explained the whole affair? On the two occasions when I had seen him, was he wandering in mind as well as body? Did his religion make him unhappy, I ventured to ask, for I was most anxious for more light on the strange being before I met him again. Yes, dreadfully. The girl's eyes were full of tears. You see, it was... She hesitated, but after a glance at me went on. There's no reason why I shouldn't tell you. I've come to look on you as a real friend. My poor father began to think he had done something very wrong. He couldn't quiet his conscience. You remember me telling you of his extraordinary flair? Well, his fortune had really been founded on three marvelous strokes of business. You see, he had exactly the same sort of luck you had here the other day. That's why I decided to tell you. It seems such an odd coincidence. She paused. Please go on, I urged. Well, on three separate occasions, he bought for a few shillings objects that were of immense value. Only unlike you, 
He did know what he was about. The profit made on their sale was no surprise to him. Unlike you, he did not then see any obligation to make it up for the ignorant people who had thrown away fortunes. After all, most dealers wouldn't, would they? she asked defensively. Well, father grew richer and richer. Years later, he met this priest, and they seemed to go sort of morbid. He began to think that our wealth had been founded on what was really no better than theft. He reproached himself bitterly for having taken advantage of those three men's ignorance. Unhappily, in each case, he succeeded in discovering what had ultimately happened to those he called his victims. Most unfortunately, all three customers had died destitute. This discovery made him incurably miserable. Two of these men had died without leaving any children, so, as no relations could be found, my father was unable to make amends. The son of the third he traced to America, but there he too died, leaving no family. So poor father could find no means of making reparation. That was what he longed for, to make reparation. His failure prayed and prayed on him until his poor dear mind became quite unhinged. As religion gained stronger and stronger hold on him, he took a queer sort of notion into his head, a regular obsession. The next best thing to doing a good deed yourself, he would say, is to provide someone else with the opportunity, to give him his cue. In our sins, Christ is crucified afresh. Because I sinned against him thrice, I must somehow be the cause of three correspondingly good actions that will counterbalance my own sins. In no other way can I atone for my crimes against Christ, for crimes they were. In vain we argued with him, assuring him that he had done only as all other men would have done. It was no use. Other men must judge for themselves. I have done what I know to be wrong, he would moan. He grew more and more fixed on his idea of expiation. It became, posit it became a positive religious mania. Determined to find three human beings who, through their good actions, would, as it were, cancel out the pain caused to divinity by what he called his three crimes, he busied himself in finding insignificant-looking works of art which he would offer for a few shillings. Poor old father, never shall I forget his joy when one day a man brought back a vase he had bought for five shillings and then discovered to be worth six hundred pounds. I think you must have made a mistake, the man said. Just as you did, bless you. Five years later a similar thing occurred, and he was oh so radiant. Two of humanity's crimes canceled out, two-thirds of his expiation achieved. Then followed years and years of weary disappointment. I shall never rest, I can't, no, never, never, until I find the third, he used to say. Here the girl began to weep. Hiding her face behind her hands, she murmured, Oh, if only you had come sooner. I heard the jingle jangle of the bell. How he must have suffered, I said. I'm so glad I had the luck to be the third. Is he satisfied now? Her hands dropped from her face. She stared at me. I heard footsteps approach. I'm so glad I'm going to meet him, I said. Meet him, she echoed in amazement as the footsteps neared. Yes. I may stay and see your father, mayn't I? I heard your sister say he would soon be here. Oh, now I understand, she exclaimed. You mean Bessie's father. But Bessie and I are only stepsisters. My poor father died years and years ago. The End